Okay, this lecture is over chapter 6 of your textbook, whose name is Files and Exceptions. So, some of the topics we will be talking about are, you know, what is uh, file input and output? How, how do we open the files? How do we read them? How do we write to them? That types of things. We'll talk about ways you can use loops to process file data. Um, we'll talk about um, something called the WIST statement that is used in conjunction with opening files. We'll talk about records and what it means to process records and the types of records. So all those things are directly related to file I.O. Um, exceptions are basically handling problems or if an error comes about, handling or taking care of that error. And one of the first places that you use exceptions and use them regularly is related to file I.O. So that's why exceptions is included in this um, chapter. So basically file I.O. is used for data, data persistence between executions of our program. So a lot of times we'll have a program, it'll read data, it'll process that data, it might create an output file and write data out. Um, other times it may read the data, may alter the data somehow, and then write that data back out so the next time the program runs you have the updated data. So reading from a file is reading information off the disk into your program and writing file data means you have an output file and you're taking data from your programming or your program and placing it in that output file. Um, so here, here's an example. This should be familiar to you from uh, 111, uh, your A-plus class. Uh, but basically we have file data and that data is on the disk. And if we are reading that data, then it is going to, well, sorry, it's talking about writing. So we have three variables here that have values, a pay rate, an employee ID, and an employee name. And we're saving that information to the disk, which means copying it from RAM uh, to, to the disk. So that's called writing data to a file. Uh, reading is just the opposite of that. It is, as I said before, taking data off the disk and reading it into your program. So if we were doing uh, this and other programs reading the data we wrote out a moment ago, or maybe it's the same program initializing, it's going to take that data that is on the disk and it is going to read it and place it in uh, variables in our Python program. Now, when you say types of files, there's different ways you can look at this. Like you might say, oh, there's JPEG files, there's GIF files, there's PNG files for images. But what they're talking about is more broad than that. Uh, we can have a text file which has text in it or characters that is encoded, for example, using ASCII. And then a binary file is binary data. So an image or an executable compiled program, something like that, that if we took in a text into a text editor would look like garbage to us because it's binary raw data. Um, as far as accessing data in a file, uh, there are two ways we can do that. Uh, sequential and direct access. Sequential means to get to a piece of data, we have to read everything in order that is before that data to make it up to the data we want to read. A direct access means we can just jump to any piece of data in the file that we want um, and do not have to read anything that is before or after the desired data. Um, as far as file names, files have names. Those names include extensions. Uh, a file extension follows a period in the name. So for example, you've probably been naming your 
programs, program1.py or pgm1.py. That .py is an extension and tells something about the data being stored there. So .p is either a Python program or a Python library. Uh, .docx would be a document that was created by a newer version of Microsoft Word. That's another example. Um, a file object is kind of an abstract thing as far as thinking about it that basically handles keeping track of the file we're reading or writing, uh, what permissions we have to that file, what location are we currently positioned in within the file, and our Python program reads and writes data from the actual file on the disk through this file object. So um, here, um, this is what's really going to happen, is we're going to have a read statement that is trying to read data and place it in a named variable. And it's going to do that through the file object. Um, to gain access to a file, that is called opening the file. And one method to do that is to say file object equals open file name mode. File name is the file name or path name to the file you want to read. And then the mode is what are you going to do? You're going to read it, you're going to write it, or you're going to append to it are examples of um, modes when you're opening a file. Uh, like I said, it receives a file name. If it does not have a path name, that means it doesn't have any slashes in it then it's going to assume the file actually has that name and that that file is located in the current directory that the program is running from. Uh, if the program runs and um, creates a file and it doesn't have a path name, it is going to be created in the same directory. Uh, if you want to specify a path that is somewhere else, um, you can do that by passing um, what they call an alternate path name. I would just say path name uh, to the open function. Uh, but it says it's going to be preceded with the letter R. So what this is like is with F strings, we have an F, a quote, and then a string that we want to write out, possibly having variable substitutions and a close quote. Um, R and then within quotes a string stands for raw string. That means there are no special or escaped characters in the string. So a lot of times you use this raw function when you have slashes that you need to include in the string um, so that it's not processing those as escape characters that it's literally saying I have a slash here. Uh, so that's where the string literal created using R is handy. Uh, if you're writing to a file, um, that's going to be through a file object as well. You're going to open it and two ways to write is giving a write mode or giving an append mode when you open the file. And then what you do is through the file variable you call its write function and then you pass it a string that you would want to write out to the file. When you're done reading and writing files you should close the file. That is done through the file variable as well. So um, sometimes called a file handle. Uh, so if I say file handle I'm talking about the uh, file variable. And what you do there is you close its method, or you call its method close. And what that does is breaks the association uh, between the file variable and the actual file itself. If it had any data buffered up before it closes the file, it will write that data out to the file so that the file has all the data and is intact. File handles have a read method that uses for uh, reading data from the file. All file is returned as a string. Uh, 
you have a read line method that is going to read one line from the file and what that does is it considers a line to be a string of characters followed by a new line character with the new line character being represented as backslash n. Um, there is a read position. Um, that read position is going to be updated when you read data, uh, especially when you're reading it line by line. So the file handle updates where it's pointing to in the file so that the next read will start at the character after the new line character. Um, when you write data out, um, it's very common to uh, concatenate a new line character on there, that is to write data out to the file one line at a time. Um, when you read, file, read a line from the file, you're going to get that new line character and here they're introducing us to a new method called rstrip and what this does is the method strips a specified character from the end of the file so if you tell it to rstrip a new line character it's going to get rid of the new line character that was read from the data file um, into your python program um, if you open a file for write and the file exists, it will be overwritten. That is, um, all the data will be erased and it will start out pointing to the beginning of that file. However, if you use the append mode for opening, then all the data that's already in the file will remain and um, any new data will be appended. Also, if you open a file for write and it does not exist, it will be created. Uh, when you write data out, um, you know, hopefully you understand by now that there is a difference between the number 34 and the string that consists of the character 3 immediately followed by the character 4. So when you're writing data out to a file, it's going to be written as a string. When you read it in, it's going to read it in as a string. So then you will need to use functions like int and float that we've seen before to convert that string to the matching integer or floating point value. Now then, a lot of times when you have files, there will be uh, lines of data or records that we'll talk about in a moment uh, that need to be processed. So what you would like to say ultimately is for every line in this file, do something. Um, the read line method will read the next line from the file and return that line to the program. However, if you're located at the end of the file and you try to read it's going to return an empty string as its sentinel value. So you can start a loop that says while well, line is not equal to single quote, single quote, which is the empty string. So as long as you can read lines, process them. Finally, when you get to the end of the file, uh, this condition will become uh, true. Um, that is, the line is equal to the empty string and your um, program, I'm sorry, your loop will terminate and you'll jump out of the loop. So here's a diagram for detecting the end of the file. It's just showing you what that while loop that we saw on the previous slide would look like. Another way you can do this is have Python handle it for you by saying for line in file object perform some statements. So what this will do is this will also iterate over each line in the file. So whichever makes more sense to you, uh, you can use it. They both accomplish the same thing which is reading a line uh, one line at a time until you hit the end of the file. Now then, um, 
one thing we alluded to before is when you open a file and you're done working with that file, you should close that file. Um, if you forget to close those files, um, you can basically build up extra data or extra garbage within your, your program that the garbage collection is not going to grab because it thinks you're still using the file. So you can use a with statement and say with and then your normal open as file, file variable and then have an indented block of code. And what's going to happen is that block of code is going to execute um, as long as um, you know you have information to read that but when you break out of this um, with loop or, or sorry with statement uh, what's going to happen is it's going to close um, the file so you can kind of contain the processing of that file to an indented block of code and get the added benefit of when that block of code is done executing that it will close your file that you're reading and or writing. Uh, so here's an example of writing an output file. Um, it's going to open a file called myfile.txt. It's going to be empty or truncated. Um, it's going to, within that statement, when you reference output underscore file, is going to write data to that file. And when that code is finishing executing, uh, it is going to be automatically closed for you. So it's just a little more detailed example. Um, here we're opening a file for read. We process the file uh, with the file handle input underscore file. And again, when we exit the with uh, what they call suite, uh, then the file is going to be automatically closed for us. Uh, a lot of times you're reading from one file and creating another file. So here it is showing you that within a WIF suite you can have a comma separated list of open statements for the file. So in this case you would presumably read from file 1 and write to file 2 and then when this block of code is done executing then it would close both those files for you. Um, a lot of times we have a construct referred to as a record and that's a set of related information. So you might have a record called person and that might have an ID number, a name, and an address for example. So that is a record, multiple pieces of information grouped together. Um, those pieces of information by themselves are referred to as fields. So you have a record in the example I gave you, um, depending on how you wrote it, we'll say there's three fields. There's your ID number, your name, and your address. Uh, you know, it could go as far as, you know, road one, road two, city, state, zip code. So maybe your fills would be more granular. Uh, but it just depends on how you're going to process that data and how you design your program. Um, so you write a record uh, to a file and it's going to write all the data in the record. You can then write another record and another record after that. Uh, to read these back, you're going to have to read them sequentially to either process them or to get up to uh, the record you want to, you know, let's say change or delete. Uh, when you're doing things with records, the records are kind of a, a rudimentary database, if you will. You should be able to add records. Um, to the file. You should be able to display records. You should be able to search for a specific record. You should be able to modify a specific record or fields within a record. And you should be able to totally delete a record as well. So if you're writing a program to process records, 
these may be a list of things that you would need to code as well uh, so that your program is useful and can effectively deal with um, records. Now then, exceptions. Um, exceptions are something that happens when something goes wrong in your program. You try to add a number to a string, for example. Um, you try to open a file that you don't have permissions to, that, that would probably generate an exception. So if we don't handle these or deal with these, then the program just abnormally halts and gives you possibly an error message. Um, that error message is going to have a trace back that tells you a little bit about the error that occurred and you know what function you were in, what program you were in, maybe what line was executing when the error occurred. So the traceback is what you're going to have to look at to try to determine what went wrong so that you can go back and try to fix your program. Um, but there are different ways to prevent exceptions. One is by doing input validation, which we've talked about. Uh, basically, you can have conditional statements that, you know, if you tell the user to input a, a file name and they, they give you an empty string, then go back and prompt them again. Um, if you're asking for positive numbers and they give you a negative number, uh, you know, go back and tell them that it has to be positive and reprompt them. Um, I think there was an example in your textbook um, of trying to take a square root. Uh, the built-in square root function in Python can only take the square root of values that are zero or greater. Um, so, you know, if somebody says they want the square root of negative one and you're not using imaginary numbers, uh, then you would want your program to, to not just blindly take the square root of negative one, which would give you an error. You know, division by zero is another thing that you might want to check for, and you'll have to be checking for that in your upcoming um, programming assignment. Um, so there are other ones that if you try to convert a non-numeric string to an integer, that is somehow you've built a string, it is not a valid number, and you call the end function on it, it's going to um, abnormally terminate and generate an exception. Um, so what we can do to kind of make our program run better and just not crash is we can have exception handlers. Uh, in Python, that's the try and accept statements. So we can try a suite of code, which is a block of code, that can potentially raise an exception. And if an exception does occur, then uh, we can handle that uh, with an accept uh, box or, or a group of statements. So uh, basically what happens is if no exceptions are raised, the handlers are sp skipped over. If an exception does occur, then it goes through and looks at the handler or set of handlers that you have following the try suite. Um, and that would be the case that they're talking about here. Sometimes there are different things that could go wrong. So you can actually have one exception um, to or one accept clause to handle all of them or you can have multiple ones that handle the different types of exceptions in different manners um, and you can have a default um, or an exception that handles everything uh, but it should be the very last exception that you list so that you can handle all the specific ones that you either care about or you know how to handle and then down at the bottom have a general um, accept clause to handle um, all the other exceptions so um, 
you can have a default message that comes out and you can pass the exemption object to print and that will display a default error message for you. Python seems to have an else clause for everything. So, uh, that's true with try and accept. Um, the else suite is a block of code that is executed after statements in the try suite only if there were no exceptions. So basically you're saying here's a bunch of exception handlers else if there's no exceptions to handle do this. Um, if you do get an exception then it handles that exception and does not execute the block of code in the else clause. There is also a finally uh, keyword or clause and basically that is executed at the end of the try regardless of whether an exception occurs or not and its purpose is to potentially do cleanup of your data or uh, file handles or whatever you're working with. Um, if you have an exception that is raised outside of try suite it's not going to be handled. It's going to cause your program to abruptly end. And if you have a bunch of accept clauses and there's no accept clause of the right type and or a default, then your program is going to abnormally terminate as well. So you need to be careful and make sure you've handled all the potential exceptions that could occur in the try suite. So that finishes up the chapter on file IO and here's just a summary of the things that we talked about in this chapter.